Today, we will learn and reflect on the life and history of one of the good Roman emperors and Stoic philosopher who was perhaps a philosopher king as described by Plato. This is the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. In particular in this video, we will reflect on the important question of whether Marcus Aurelius was a persecutor or a friend of Christians, which is an important question asked by those of us who find inspiration in Stoicism and in the ancient world, and in particular, this was a question also asked by Eusebius, uh, who was a renowned uh, church historian in the time of the first Christian emperor, Constantine the Great. So, we have a real dilemma of this Roman emperor, who likely oversaw the brutal persecution of Christians, but whose Stoic main work, his meditations, offers a Stoic philosophy that reflects many of the Christian teachings, both in the Pauline epistles and the Gospels. To provide some examples of this dilemma, these are some quotations from the meditations selected in the Copleston History of Philosophy. And this is some of the quotations from meditations. Love mankind, follow God, which is very close to love God and love your neighbor. It is man's special gift to love even those who fall into blunder. Uh, that sin is ignorance and unintentional, that in a little while we shall both be dead, and above all, no injury has been done to us. Our inner self is not made worse than it was before. This last quote is quite similar to the section of the early Christian prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own faults and to not judge my brother, since you are blessed to the ages of ages. We have another video sharing many of the Stoic sayings from Marcus Aurelius' work, The Meditations. And at the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video and my blogs that also cover this topic. Please, we welcome interest and questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. First, we need to review the history and timelines around the time of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, you can see that Marcus Aurelius succeeded the generation that included the previous well-known Roman Stoic philosophers, Seneca, Epictetus, and Rufus, and also St. Paul, and also the emperor from a hundred years previous, Nero. In his meditations, Marcus Aurelius expresses his admiration for the philosophical works of Epictetus, and it is very likely that he read the works of Seneca. We can presume that he never read the actual epistles of Paul nor the Gospels, uh, or else he may not have uh, been so quick to persecute the Christians. Unfortunately, the great uh, Roman historians preceded Marcus Aurelius. There's really not any good first-class histories or sources from the ancient world for the life and reign of Marcus Aurelius, so we have to piece it together from various sources, and we're uncertain of many of the details of his life and his reign, and that includes any role that he may have had in persecuting the Christians. Going back into history, we know that the Emperor Hadrian, one of the good emperors, wanted to guarantee a stable succession, and so he selected Antonius Pius to be the next emperor, and he adopted him and his son, and he requested that uh, he in turn adopt Marcus Aurelius as his son to ensure this peaceful succession. To seal the succession, Marcus Aurelius married Faustina, the daughter of Antonius Pius. If her name, Faustina, seems prophetic, it certainly is prophetic, for she is indirectly responsible for the decline of the Roman Empire. Marcus Aurelius agreed to be emperor out of Stoic duty. He would have preferred to remain as a philosopher. During his reign, the Germanic border tribes were in rebellion, and he was in the field of battle more than he was in Rome during his reign, which means that he may not have been personally involved in many of these Christian persecutions. Now let us fill in some background on the history of the persecutions themselves. There was never a thorough and systematic persecution of Christians in the entirety of the Roman Empire like there was in Orthodox Russia after the Communist Revolution. Emperor Nero briefly and brutally persecuted the Christians. We see this picture of the Christians in his garden on the crosses lit up for his entertainment. Uh, Nero blamed the Christians for the fire that burned down so much of Rome. 
but likely only the high profile Christians were picked up. Uh, the brutality of Nero no doubt caused many Romans to sympathize with the Christians so willing to die for their faith and pr probably provided a unwelcome precedent that ensured at least sporadic persecution of Christians in the following centuries. Now there was not a general persecution of Christians uh, throughout the Roman Empire until over 200 years later after Nero under Emperor Diocletian. But even then, many provincial governors were sympathetic to the Christians. They were not eager to execute those citizens whom they saw as harmless. Between these two emperors, Christians were persecuted sporadically. The severity of the persecutions against the Christians depended on how hostile the provincial governors and local officials were against the Christians. Around the year 250 AD, we have a remarkable series of letters preserved between a provincial governor, Pliny the Younger, and Emperor Trajan, which is doubly remarkable because we so rarely have preserved in antiquity both sides of any correspondence. Pliny asked Trajan if he is following the proper legal procedure in his persecutions of the Christians in his province. He explains that he does not seek out the Christians, but when there is a complaint, he brings the Christians before him, and if the Christian shows reverence to the ancestral God by sprinkling a little bit of incense before a bust of the emperor, he releases them. Trajan's short reply to Pliny says that he's on the right path, but he adds some caveats. Uh, he gives four orders. Don't seek out the Christians for trial. But then he adds to this a due process procedure that anonymous accusations should not be considered at all. Also, if the accused are guilty of being Christians, then they must be punished. But if the accused deny they are Christians and show proof that they are not worshiping the gods, then they must be pardoned. Now that we have some general background of the history of Marcus Aurelius and the Roman Empire, we can further consider the question of whether Marcus Aurelius is a friend or a foe of Christians. By far, our most important source is the Ecclesiastical History or Church History by Eusebius, who was an important bishop during the reign of the first Christian Emperor Constantine. Like modern historians, Eusebius considers that there is a strong position for the case that Marcus Aurelius did persecute personally the Christians to some extent, but unlike emperors like Nero, he would not have enjoyed watching them. Perhaps he would have watched them out of a sense of duty. Eusebius begins chapter 5 with a detailed, gruesome account of Christians being tortured and executed over periods of many days during the reigns of Marcus Aurelius. But then Eusebius follows this with a remarkable account of how God helped the soldiers of Marcus Aurelius defeat the enemy, the Germans, with a miracle. And this is a quote from Eusebius. While his predecessor Antonius Pius was still on the throne, Marcus Aurelius faced the German tribes in battle, and his soldiers in the Melitene Legion facing the enemy did a remarkable thing. They knelt in prayer and turned to God in supplication. The enemy was astonished at the sight, and immediately a thunderbolt drove the enemy to flight and destruction, while rain fell on the army which had called on the Almighty, reviving the army when the entire force was on the point of perishing from thirst. And he says that Tertullian witnesses to this miracle in his work titled Apology or in Defense of the Faith. But then Eusebius concludes, but everyone must make up his own mind about such matters. In addition to these two sources, there is another ancient account which likely refers to the same incident, appended to the first apology to the emperor by Saint Justin the Martyr, who was also martyred during the time of Marcus Aurelius. And he was an early Christian uh, philosopher. He has a curious work appended to this, an epistle of Marcus Aurelius to the Roman Senate. In this epistle, Marcus Aurelius recounts a miracle in a campaign where the Roman army found himself in desperate straits against the Germans. The emperor prayed to the pagan gods for deliverance, and when he learned that many of his soldiers were Christians, he asked that they pray to their god as well. This epistle tells of these Christians how, when they began the battle, not by preparing weapons, nor arms, nor bugles, for such preparation is hateful for them. On account of their God, they bear about in their conscience. Now, we, St. Justin the Martyr was martyred in Rome when the pagans 
Cynic philosopher Crescens agitated for his execution. In this martyr account, Marcus Aurelius is not mentioned. There's likely no scholar today who really thinks that Marcus Aurelius was the author of this curious epistle. And many scholars can prove that some of the history recounted by Eusebius is more myth and legends than history. But whether or not these accounts are historical is not the point. The main point is that some early Christians wanted Marcus Aurelius to be a friend of the Christians, and they recognized the wisdom of his Stoic teachings. However, unfortunately, several quotes by Marcus Aurelius himself suggest that maybe he was not a friend of the Christians. And he has a critical view of the resurrection of the body in Book 4 of the Meditations. If souls continue to, to exist, how does the air contain them from eternity? Marcus Aurelius then speculates that souls eventually diffuse to make room for other souls. Then he adds, We must not only think of the bodies that are buried, but also the animals that are eaten by us and other animals. For these animals that are consumed are also buried in the bodies of those who feed on them. And similarly, when St. Paul preaches to the Athenians in Acts 17, it is the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead that Greeks have trouble accepting. And also this is referred to in John 6. And I'd like to point out that uh, modern Christians have a so somewhat of a Platonic sense that when we die, our spirit uh, goes to heaven and our body is buried in the earth. The ancient Christians had a very firm belief in the physical resurrection of the body. Uh, this comment from the Meditations suggests that maybe Marcus Aurelius did indeed witness some martyrdoms. He says, a great soul is ready at any requisite moment to be separated from the body and then to be extinguished or dispersed and continue to exist. And this is a common theme in Greek philosophy and the warrior culture in which they existed, the desire to die the noble death. But then this readiness must come from a man's own judgment and not from mere obstinacy, as with the Christians, but considerably and with great dignity and in a way to persuade another without tragic show. And we would like to point out that many bishops from the period discouraged their flock from volunteering for martyrdom. Perhaps they agreed with Marcus Aurelius to some extent. Modern scholars have also puzzled about this paradox of Marcus Aurelius, whether he is a friend or a foe of the Christians. Henry Chadwick, in his history of the early church, notes that Marcus Aurelius regarded suicide as ethically unobjectionable but felt that it must be done in good style, not like the Christians in a spirit of theatricality. Henry Chadwick says a certainty that Marcus Aurelius ordered the persecution of Christians in Gaul, which is today's France, writing that the emperor Marcus Aurelius directed that the Christians should be tortured to death and that no refinement of cruelty was spared. I personally question the possibility that Marcus Aurelius made it to Gaul, but but perhaps Chadwick has read some history that I'm not aware of. Walter Kaufman, in his introduction, writes that uh, Marcus Aurelius, for reasons of state, possibly sanctioned the persecution of Christians. And although he personally achieved a genuinely Christian depth of humility. We have an even more interesting quote by Matthew Arnold. What an affinity for Christian had this persecutor of Christians. The effusion of Christianity, its relieving tear, its happy self-sacrifice were the very element one feels for which the soul of Marcus Aurelius longed. The Christians were near him. They brushed him. He touched them. But Marcus Aurelius passed them by. And we have a quote by Copleston, who is the author of a multi-volume history of philosophy that's used by many Catholic colleges and seminaries. Marcus Aurelius was punctiliously observant of the forms of polytheistic worship, which partially explains why he persecuted the Christians during his reign, since he clearly viewed the pagan religious rites of state worship as implied in good citizenship. And we have a quote by McGuckin, Marcus Aurelius mentioned Christians with a distaste reserved for secretive and maleficent magical sects. Now, however, wise and kind Marcus Aurelius had been, as a competent and good Roman emperor, all his striving and kindness would have been overshadowed by the stain left by his son, his petty, vicious, and lazy, narcissistic son, the Emperor Commodus, 
whose character far more closely resembled that of Nero than his father. History tells us that there were credible rumors that Commodus was not the actual son of Marcus Aurelius, that rather his mother Faustinus had an affair with a gladiator uh, while Marcus Aurelius was away fighting the Germanic tribesmen. Now Marcus Aurelius was the last of the seven good Roman emperors, and most of these good emperors were adopted by their predecessor. But Marcus Aurelius instead chose Commodus as his co-emperor, although he knew that Commodus was irresponsible and did not want to adopt the Stoic virtues. When Marcus Aurelius died on the front, Commodus abandoned the war and negotiated a quick peace with the Germans and retreated to Rome to pose as a gladiator. And Commodus was more like Nero than his father Marcus Aurelius and he was eventually assassinated after he started murdering his closest associates. His reign began many decades of political inaction and instability when Rome was assaulted by both Roman tribesmen and Persians. Now to discuss some of the sources I used for this video. You know, from Amazon I picked up the Dover Thrift of Edition of the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is also included in the Stoic Six Pack. However, I found the translation of the Meditations in the Six Pack to be undecipherable. Now, Marcus Aurelius is quite readable. You should purchase this book and read it for yourself. Rufus Fears of the Teaching Company has a highly entertaining lecture on Marcus Aurelius in the Teaching Company lecture series. He has a persuasive argument that this philosopher king was more of a philosopher than a king, that Marcus Aurelius lacked the will to power that would have enabled a greater Roman emperor to establish an enduring legacy of imperial power. He also faults Marcus Aurelius for not putting aside his unfaithful wife Faustina and his vicious and incompetent son Commodus for the good of the empire, and that he should have followed tradition and adopted a qualified emperor instead like the other good Roman emperors. And I also would like to mention the excellent video by Professor Luke Timothy Johnson on the Greco-Roman uh, practical philosophers. And he has a excellent discussion of the Stoic philosophers in general. And this was a video series that really changed my life to a certain extent and gave me a better view and introduction into uh, the Stoic philosophers. Also, we have quoted in here it's a, by Eusebius a an Early History of the Church by Eusebius and Modern History by Henry Chadwick. And I would advise you to read both of these histories yourself. And we also have uh, by Coppelson, History of Philosophy. And there's probably a dozen volumes of this. And if you're very interested in philosophy, it's a little bit harder to read, but it's good. We also ran across another book, Meditations of uh, Marcus Aurelius with Commentary. And this is, this is a good book. We didn't really use it for this video, but it's uh, a good book to look at. Uh, please click on the link for our blogs on Marcus Aurelius and on the links for our YouTube videos on the Greek Cynic and Stoic Philosophers and other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.